After over a decade as a director for documentaries and shorts about some of the biggest bands in the world like U2, Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, Nine Inch Nails, and plenty more, from 2003 to 2007, Mark Pellington worked as a consulting producer on over 80 episodes of the TV show Cold Case. If you're a fan of true crime podcasts, I'm sure you've heard of it. But if not, that was the show on CBS that covered unsolved crimes. When watching that show, we don't really think to question whether or not the crimes actually happened. We don't really question the validity of the events that took place. But just before working on Cold Case, Mark worked on a movie that I'd venture to guess you do question the validity of. It's not quite a documentary like some of his earlier work, but for some, it could be. At least a Hollywoodized version of events that many claim to be based on a true story. This week, we're going to celebrate Halloween in style as we dive into a film that Mark directed in 2002, The Mothman Prophecies. But what am I saying? It's Halloween. Nothing good ever comes from being alone in scary movies. So I'm super excited this week to chat with Sam Fredrickson from the Not Alone podcast as we dive into the true stories behind the Mothman prophecies. I'm Dan Lefebvre, and this is Based on a True Story. Before we pull Sam onto the show, let's set up our game. If you're new to the show, this game is Two Trues and a Lie. So I'm going to give you three statements. Two of them are true. And one of them is a lie. Listen closely for the two truths scattered throughout the episode, and then by a process of elimination, you'll know which one was a lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. Okay, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, the Silver Bridge really did collapse, killing many people. Number two, John Klein was real, but he actually worked for the New York Times, not the Washington Post. Number three, Mothman sightings weren't the only weird thing that was reported in Point Pleasant. All right, you got those three? Without further ado, let's dive into my chat with Sam Fredrickson about the Mothman prophecies. With Halloween right around the corner, this week I'm excited to be joined by Sam Fredrickson from the Not Alone podcast to talk about the stories behind the movie The Mothman Prophecies. Before we dive into that though, Sam, I know you just did a series on Mothman, so can you let that one person who's listening to this and hasn't heard of your show yet (laughs) know where they can find it? Yeah, you can just head right over to iTunes, or sorry, Apple Podcasts. You can head right over to Apple Podcasts. Search for Not Alone there. Uh, You can search for it really on every podcatcher. I haven't found one yet that doesn't have us on it. So just by searching Not Alone, uh, or you can go to our our website, notalonepodcast.com. All of our episodes are listed there in little blog posts, and they'll have like more um, about the episode, different links and stuff like that. We're in the middle of Mothman right now. We originally said it was going to be a two-parter but the more and more i i do the outline for part two the more and more i'm afraid it's going to turn into a three-parter so we'll just see how that turns out (laughs) it's funny how that works huh yeah it really is (laughs) well i really appreciate you taking the same thing join me today um yeah let's just kind of start with talking about the mothman prophecy so the movie is actually set in 2002 which was the same year that it was released um, and the right. main character is a Washington Post reporter named John Klein, who's played by Richard Gere. So right. I guess the first question I'd have for you is, with your research, is John Klein really a reporter for the Washington Post? Is he a, even a real person that this whole story is based around? That's a great question. Um, it's very interesting. Essentially, John Klein is, is John Keel who is the author of the Mothman Prophecies, but he's John Keel if John Keel was not a, you know, didn't report on fringe uh, fringe phenomena, if he didn't go chasing UFOs, if he had a nice respectable job being a reporter for the Washington Post. Essentially, during the time of the Mothman Prophecies, John Keel is an accredited journalist. He works, or he's accredited by the North American Newspaper Alliance, 
uh, which is one of the larger, basically, press associations uh, and was also home to, in its day, people like Ernest Hemingway, uh, people like F. Scott Fitzgerald. So it is a, a real organization, but he himself at this point was more of just a freelance reporter. Mm. And instead of chasing politics like the movie really shows him out to be, he's more of chasing saucers and uh, uh, the paranormal or, or just the fringe, the Fortean, to give it that term. So a little less coincidental that he happened to stumble upon this. He was kind of out looking for it. Exactly. Yeah. The the Mothman prophecies, the movie, it does. It it makes it seem like this weird, mysterious thing where, what is it? He's driving. He doesn't know how, but he covers 400 miles in an hour or something like yeah, that. Yeah, he like loses in, time. Yeah. Yeah. In reality, he was looking for this. He <laughs> he went to, to Point Pleasant, West Virginia, because he had heard about what was going on, and he knocked on doors and, and found exactly what he was looking for. So let that be a lesson to you. Be careful what you look for. You might actually find yeah, it. <laughs> exactly. Especially if that's a Mothman. Yeah. You really, you really got to wonder about that. But so, if what about some of the other characters? Then I know, like uh, Laura Linney plays a major role as Connie Mills, uh, kind of the the sheriff there in town. Was she a real person as well? Uh, again, you have the the role, right? The the physical um, John. Keel or John Klein's friend in town, the authority figure, that person does exist. Her name's Mary Heyer. She's actually, she's a the Point Pleasant correspondent for the Athens, Ohio Messenger newspaper. Mm. So it's, it's interesting, though, because to be fair, I can totally see why they made her a sheriff. She is a trusted member of the community. People look to her. People... Uh, implicitly they trust her and her word so you have a lot of stories of you know john keel saying well i went to meet this person this person didn't seem too happy to see a reporter and so then i brought mary higher with me and they were happy to talk because mary is part of the town um so i can totally see why they would make her a cop uh it kind of it fits the same persona and makes it less complicated to explain well i'm a correspondent for a newspaper that's based in a different state but everybody here trusts me regardless so <laughs> but yeah at the at the very base of who she is she is a, a real person okay interesting what about uh will pattinson's or sorry not pattinson will Patton, <laughs> his character gordon smallwood <laughs> Yeah, Gordon is, he's a composite character. Okay. He is a composite between, the primary one is a fella named Woodrow Derenberger, who is probably, beyond Mothman, probably my favorite, favorite aspect of the Point Pleasant case. Woodrow Derenberger is the salesman uh, who essentially is driving home one night when he's he meets a, an alien or at least somebody who seems like an alien a spaceman at least and Darren Berger interacts with this individual however Gordon Smallwood takes it a little bit beyond where you actually have him composed of different conti- contactees as well that John Keel is communicating with during this time who speak with people other than Indrid Cold, which is the the alien that Woodrow Derenberger speaks with. Hmm. So again, you have at the very base of his his core, he is a real person, but in this case, he's actually multiple people thrown in. The only one whose name we know for sure is Woodrow Derenberger. Everybody else, John Keel gives a pseudonym to, essentially. Interesting. So, and I guess the the kind of the last character that I would mention would be Alexander Leake, who is um, kind of the guy that uh, Richard Gere's John Klein went to as the expert, right? He was kind of the, yes. he was the physics professor at Cornell, and he was the one that was kind of rooting all of this in in science as as far as the right. movie is concerned, at least. <laughs> right. Um, he that and that fella is my favorite character in the movie. To be straight the uh the cornell physics professor hmm. um just because he's like he's searching for something then he finds it then he goes mad and and all of this that's one of my favorite archetypes and stereotypes 
there is no one who really fits that bill. You do have a fella named Ivan Sanderson, who is kind of like Keel's mentor in a way, but Sanderson's a zoologist, which would fit into this, right? If we're talking about an unknown bird, which is what everyone kind of started by saying Mothman is, it would make sense that that Dr. Sanderson would be influential to John Keel, but you don't at all have the same sort of direct, like, Un- unraveling or unveiling of knowledge, presenting that knowledge to uh, John Keel through a, a different individual. Mm. Keel pretty much finds out everything he finds out through interviewing witnesses and Mary Heyer, who's been keeping records and, and interviewing everybody else, basically. You don't have any central character that John Keel ever interacts with who has all of the answers. It almost sounds... Um based on kind of how you're explaining it with um, John Keel going out looking for it as opposed to John Klein in the movie who kind of stumbled upon it. Yes. I'm, I wonder if maybe Alexander Leak was kind of the, uh, almost another side of the real, of, of John Keel, right? If John Keel was the one who actually went to go um, look for it, well, then maybe there's kind of these two sides that the movie almost split into two characters, or did split into two characters, right? And one of them is the, um, the one who is you know rooted in science and trying to find the answers to this, and the other one is the one that's just kind of stumbling upon all of these things. Um, I don't know. It's it just kind of interesting that they would change that in the movie to where it, it at it's it's like this guy who's asking the questions. I mean, as as the viewer, I can see that as you know we're the ones asking the questions, um, right? And John Keel would be doing the same thing, but then he's also the same one that's answering those questions by doing the interviews and, and you know, going out there right, and finding those right. answers. <laughs> Honestly, Keel is such an interesting person in real, in, in real life. Um, I think that you might be completely correct. Like I hadn't even thought of that, but John Keel was, was such a, a, a fascinating individual who, after getting out of the army, he like went to India to research basically the greatest stage illusion that that was ever known to man at that point, which was a trick called the Indian rope trick. While he was there, he went searching for the Yeti, essentially. And he is he is the kind of paranormal Indiana Jones character, but with the biggest difference of Keel, unlike um Unlike Alexander Leake, the character, Keel never lost his mind, never, never... He did go a little paranoid at the end of it, but he never really shut himself away like this character does. But I do see where they'd want to get John Klein to be a relatable character, Mm -hmm. somebody who who doesn't seem like, of course, the, the... I hate to say it, but the crazy, right? <laughs> the the guy going out chasing aliens. You that that character is not relatable. The guy who gets things thrust upon them and then goes to find it from this this other crazy person, like that is more relatable. So I do think that you have a point there. I I really do. I think that's a great idea. Hmm. What? Okay, so it, kind of setting up the the characters. Then what about the? Uh, well, let's start with the location. Point Place, I think anybody, I'm assuming, would know that Point Place is actually a, a real uh, location. Um, but is it is it as we kind of saw in the movie, you know, kind of, uh, you know, where it's located and, and with, with the bridge there? Was that something that, is that actually a real place? Yes, yeah, it's, um, it's, so it's Point Pleasant, West Virginia. You're right. And it Point is. Pleasant. I said that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I couldn't remember if in the movie, if maybe they called it Point Place. No, no. And in my notes, I have Point Pleasant. I have no idea why I said Point Place. Maybe because I was thinking location That's... and place. It's completely. <laughs> That's totally fine. Yeah. Um, Point Pleasant is definitely a real place. It is it is the small town, right? It's the small town that's that's kind of shown in this movie the mothman prophecies as of the 2010 census i didn't go back to see what it was in 1960 but as of 2010 there were only 4350 people living there like it is it is definitely your kind of backwoods small not 
tiny, but not a, a big metropolitan center, you know. Yeah. It, I think they probably got the feel of it pretty well. Now, you you mentioned um, the 60s, right? And that kind of brings to the next uh, question that I had. So the movie is actually based in 2002, which right. is, you know, I mean, I mean, he's using cell phones, which, grant, I mean, granted it was not the same kind of cell phones we have now, <laughs> 2002 cell phones. Um, right. But, you know, right. using those kind of mobile phones and that kind of thing is obviously not something they had in the 60s. So is that, and then they just completely mixed up the timing there or is that something that uh, yeah no that's a that's a great question and that is exactly exactly <laughs> what happened basically the events of of mothman right and and to be fair and we'll get i'm sure we'll get a little more into it here but there is so much more than mothman to this um it is it is one of the greatest stories in the world because there's so much more than Mothman to this. But basically what happens is Mothman shows up on November 15th, 1966. Okay. And then he stays for exactly 13 months and disappears December 15th, 1967. Hmm. This, because it is a, it has a, a designated beginning date and a designated end date. It's what's known in paranormal research, even normal research. uh, It is what's known as a flap or a a window period is what others might call it. So there are no indications. There were no reports of Mothman uh, or anything else really happening in Point Pleasant, West Virginia in 2002. It's all just that that 13 month period taken from 1967 to 66 and transposed into 2002. Hmm. I wonder if that too then would kind of go back to making it more relatable, which Mm -hmm. if that's the case, and again, which kind of, I'm, I'm assuming here what, you know, I don't have any, any facts to back this up, but if they're doing that and kind of making it more relatable to the current time, because the movie did come out in 2002. So you set in present day, as far as, you know, when the movie was released, and then also right. kind of splitting, if that theory of splitting uh, John Keel into multiple characters to make one of those characters the more relatable, the one that, that asks the questions and kind of comes at this, you know, just kind of blindsided by all of these events happening. Um, I wonder if the filmmakers would do that in order to to help make it seem a little more believable and a little more real um, for, obviously, when you have things like this happening you have a lot of people that are skeptics and you know just instantly are just going to throw it out the window right (laughs) right (laughs) right my co-host is like that (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah it's uh i do think that that's a big part of it you know the thing about this whole thing is i i watched the mothman prophecies i actually held off i had not watched it until i got about half the way through the book actually a few weeks ago because I didn't want it to color my interpretation of the Mm. events at all while doing research for the show and really what what it truly comes down to is that the moth the events of Point Pleasant 66 to 67 they defy a simple causal narrative structure they defy a point A to point P to point C, plot point, plot point, plot point, you know, acts one, two, three, and end. It is simply, at its core, a nonsensical jumbled mess. Like, and it's it's one of the most beautiful nonsensical jumbled messes I've ever seen. But for them to even be able to make anything half as good as what that movie came out to be is extremely impressive. Um, and it... I feel like because of that, there's no way that they're going to be able to cover it with 100% accuracy. And so I think that for them to transpose the time and even transpose the characters, because the other thing is John Keel is still alive when this movie comes out. He dies in 2009. The the afterword of the Mothman Prophecies uh, book that I have, the copy I have, he mentions it. He says Hollywood's trying their best to make sense of this, and and it seems as though they've got a good head start on it. Hmm. So, to me, that would say that Keel himself was probably pretty okay 
with how this was all panning out with what the script was looking like and all that to the point where honestly I, I feel like the important thing is to tell as much of the story as you can in a way that will not scare off the the uh, audience, right? John Keel wants the story out. Rich Haddam, who wrote the wrote the Mothman Prophecies movie, he wants the story out. Everybody wants people to know about this. If it makes a lot of money, all the better. But I really think for the actual people involved, that was their main concern. And I think that that it makes total and complete sense to make it as relatable as possible, whether it's, it's the characters, the time place or the timeline, all of it. So I do, I think that, that getting it to be something we can grasp and we can understand, I think that was a big part of the production. And I think they did very well at it. Hmm. Now, now earlier you mentioned uh, injured cold and you also (laughs) referred to alien. Now I know in the movie they, talk about Indrid Cold as heavily implied. I don't think they ever actually come out and have dialogue that says it, but heavily implied Indrid Cold is the Mothman. So are you right. saying Mothman is an alien? Are you saying, I mean, what's, I guess kind of, you know, <laughs> laying, laying out that, okay, that's a, <laughs> a t- tough one, you know, single question there, which kind of yeah. lay out, let's, uh, you know, who was Indrid Cold and how does he kind of yes. play into this story? Yes, totally. Indrid Cold... Indrid Cold is one of the most fascinating characters. I think I've said that about everything so far, but I mean it. He is one of the most fascinating characters in your modern American UFO for- folklore, um, the the mythos of UFOs. Essentially, Indrid Cold is an individual who... So there's a difference, okay? Let me just start with that. The movie shows, I believe, it's that the character based on Woody Derenberger is driving past like the old chemical plant and he meets Indrid Cold there and Indrid Cold tells him people are going to die and not to be afraid and it's okay. Right. If I'm, if I'm getting it correct. Yeah. That's uh, Will Patton's uh, Gordon Smallwood character. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in, and I am going to say this in real life, what actually happened because (laughs) I do believe that this happened some way or another. I don't know if it was a completely physical interaction, if parts of it were mental or what, but essentially what happens is Woody Derenberger is driving home. He's a traveling salesman, and I think he sells sewing sewing machines. He's driving home to his wife and his two kids, and as he's as he's uh oh what's let me double check where it is that he's he's at but he's pointing he's passing a city which is parkersburg so he's po- he's passing parkersburg and suddenly a long dark object passes in front of his truck and he says okay whatever i just got cut off this object then flips sideways long ways blocking the entire roadway and out of it steps this individual. He's about six foot six. He's got long black slicked back hair. He has this big smile, which has led to him being called the Grinning Man. And he approaches the car and telepathically, for some reason, telepathically, he tells Woody Derenberger to roll down the window. He doesn't need to because they don't actually speak the entire time this is happening. They all do it telepathically in their heads. And it's such a bizarre interaction because basically Cold says to Derenberger, what is that? And he he motions over to Parkersburg. He says, what is that? And Woody Derenberger has to kind of explain like what a city is. And he says, oh, in my in my world, we call them gatherings. He says, don't be afraid because I come from a country much weaker than yours. And he just asks, like, who are you? What is a city? Where are you going? What are these lights? Like all of these different weird questions. And then he says, Mr. Derenberger, we will be seeing you again. And he climbs into his saucer and he takes off into the night sky. There's nothing at all inherently sinister about it like it other than you're meeting an individual from a different potentially a different world (laughs) like it 
as far as we know, the evidence suggests that Indrid Cold is really just a groovy space alien. That's that's all it is. <laughs> Whereas Mothman is is this terrible force, right? So I would say that it is it's also one of the best questions out there. Does Indrid Cold implicitly have anything at all to do with Mothman? There's no answer. It, it, you can argue for it. You can argue against it. But Indrid Cold never mentions Mothman, is never never seen around the same time as Mothman. The only person to really interact with Cold specifically is Darrenberger, and Darrenberger never sees Mothman or has his own Mothman experience. So it's entirely impossible to say. Myself, personally, I like to think that Cold had something to do, something more on the observational side of things. Um, but yeah, he's, he's definitely not Mothman. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. I don't know exactly what he is, but. Well, it, it, if uh, memory serves me right from some of the research that I did for this, um, Indrid Cole in the um, folklore of, of this also goes by the name Grinning Man, correct? Yes, yes, and especially in his post Point Pleasant days, because people have reported seeing him after this. Okay, he's known as the Grinning Man. Okay, and so I would assume the only way to keep that grin on your face is to speak telepathically of some sort. Otherwise, you'd have to open your mouth to talk, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, totally. <laughs> well, that, that's interesting, though, that he would say um, we will be seeing you again. Mm-hmm. I mean. Um, I wonder, and again, I'm just kind of thinking of off the top of my head here, if mm-hmm. if they're seen in around the same time, um, and there's, as far as I know, no reason to assume that they don't know about each other, right? If right. they're happening around the same time. I wonder if the we that he's referring to maybe would be Mothman. Do you think that's a it plausible is- theory? It is a plausible theory. Uh, you also have the the tiny little detail that I left out, but when his craft comes back down, a hand reaches out to grab him oh. and and to to take Cold back into the craft. I forgot to mention that. Well, that's scary. So okay. yeah, it well, I, it is scary. <laughs> it's more like a. I would say it's more like a gesture of brotherhood. Okay, <laughs> being okay. like, come, space brother, let us ascend to the stars. Okay. okay, um, and to me, that's what that's how I've always taken it. Okay. Is just Indrid Cold and whoever else is on that freaking ship. We're going to see you again. Hmm. Inter- that's but interesting. Again, there's there's no way to say that for sure. It could be Mothman. It could be anything. I mean, that's what's so, so interesting about it. So I, I have to ask then, in, in your research, other than Mothman and uh, Indrid Cold, if they're not related then... Um, because you said Indrid mm-hmm. Cold didn't mention Mothman at all. Were there any other sort of um, sightings of things during this time period that might or might not be related, but, you know, kind of we've kind of related at least because they happen around yeah. the same time and in the same place? This is this is my favorite question I've ever been asked. Um, <laughs> the The short answer is yes. The long answer, longer answer is Essentially, for these 13 months, Point Pleasant, I was actually just talking with with a a friend who, you know, every year they go, they have a Mothman festival Mm -hmm. in Point Pleasant. It's so ingrained in their identity. They keep this tradition alive. He, He had gone there and he said... He just got the feeling listening to the stories that people told and and learning the more about it. He felt almost as if Point Pleasant was taken from this reality and transposed into another reality for just 13 months. Because hmm. in addition to Indrid Cold, in addition to Mothman, you have an unprecedented unprecedented number of UFO sightings. You have Mary Heyer telling us that on one weekend at the peak of activity, she received over 500 reports of UFOs in and around this area. You have John Keel talking about going up to the Five Mile Creek Bridge lookout point that he he stakes out in a place called Gallipolis Ferry, which is just a few miles up the river from Point Pleasant, 
and going out there every night and every night seeing UFOs and signaling to him to them with his his flashlight and having them signal back. You even have Mary Heyer going with him, seeing this happen, and then signing an affidavit saying like John Keel signaled the thing with three three bright flashes. The UFO signaled back to us with three flashes, and then it zipped into the night sky and disappeared. Like it is, it is one of the highest periods of UFO activity, not only in the Ohio River Valley but also nationwide, according to Keel. I wasn't able to to open my search parameters wide enough to really dig into the national UFO events at the time, just because it takes so much effort focusing on this one tiny town. But essentially, he says that you've got stories from Oregon all the way to Maine of of saucers, of UFOs of all types. And you have interesting sorts of things happening as well, sort of more like psychic phenomena that happens in, in relation to the UFOs, because John Keel's biggest thing, and it's something that the more research I do on UFOs, the more I read... His big thing is that he no longer believed UFOs to be extraterrestrial in origin. Same thing with Mothman. He didn't believe that Mothman was a, a, a alien creature or a cryptid or anything like that. He referred to Mothman as an ultra-terrestrial as opposed to an extraterrestrial. So John Keel believes that these things happen both in the mind and in real life one of the best examples of this that that he has to give is that i believe it was in or around the point pleasant area but it may have been part of that that bigger national uh national flap at the time there was an individual who saw just in the road and this man was was a a sober man he was keel described him as one of the most reliable witnesses he had ever met he described seeing a metal sphere with four legs, each with a little wheel on the bottom of them, and a propeller just hovering in the middle of the road. And then the propeller sped up, and the the sphere shot off into the sky, which is one of the most quaint, like, UFO sightings I've ever heard of. Like, Hmm. oh, it has a propeller, and it's using that to, you know, go across the stars. And it... It's completely nonsensical, but a week after this is reported to Keel in a famous magazine at the time, I think it's called Fate, uh, basically some engineers got together and they designed hypothetical UFOs, and one of them was completely and totally, detail for detail, this exact same thing, this exact same metal sphere with the wheels and the propeller, and it was a tongue-in-cheek thing. Of course, the engineer knows this thing can't make it through space, but he says, well, if I have to draw a UFO, I'm going to draw this. Keel makes the point that this sort of UFO was never seen before and has never been reported since. And it's almost as if, psychically, somebody was thinking about this. It, It transversed through whatever it uses to transverse, got in this other guy's head, and then manifested. And that's the kind of weird stuff that Keel was was faced with. Like, if we take his book, and as somebody who who has a good amount of respect for John Keel, I take his book and I believe what he's saying. I don't think he's outright outright lying or anything like that. Interpretations may be different, but it's that sort of strange phenomena that that surrounds Mothman. And so we have to ask if the UFOs are are happening in our heads may or may not be actually happening in reality, but also happening in our heads. What about Mothman? Is he in our heads? Is he in reality? Is he that weird mix of both? Um, and that's really what Keel was trying to find. But you also of course have another great component, which is the men, in, the men in black, right? So where there are UFOs, there are men in black and that is the other fourth component, right? If you have to break down point pleasant, In these days, you have Mothman is one, John Keel is two. He's his own element. UFOs and their inhabitants are three, and the men in black are four. So this is actually a four-faceted phenomena, Um, and it is all happening in Point Pleasant in the same amount of time. And the most frustrating thing is, is besides the UFO and the men in black, 
there's no way to tell <laughs> what else is related and how it's related and why. And that's where the the um, posturing comes in. That's where the, the theorizing comes in. And that's why it's one of the best cases ever. So is was this phenomenon kind of the first time that the men in black were, um, well, not that we know a lot about them anyway, but, um, <laughs> you know, was it kind of the first time that they kind of came to the forefront as, as much as they Not have? necessarily. Um, the men in black, so John Keel as well, one of his, his best, like, things that he's known for are, is coining the term men in black. That wasn't Will Smith? And while they... No, it wasn't Will Smith. Um, although that might unfortunately be what, what he goes down in history for, uh, which would be sad. But yeah, so you you have John Keel who coined this term and worked a lot with them, or not worked with them, but, but worked in that area. Essentially, though, he is not the, this is not the first time they showed up. He just really coined the term. The very first time... Hmm that they that he really showed up was um there was an individual called Albert K Bender and Bender uh he went ahead and he formed the first ever international UFO organization uh, essentially he called it the International Flying Saucer Bureau he in the year i want to say when was it here let me double check I want to say it was actually in the early 50s. So he he creates this International Flying Saucer Bureau and Bender during this time as well is just kind of losing it. And his entire family has been plagued with health problems, uh, cancer, tumors of the brain, things like that. And he's he's losing it after having this International Flying Saucer Bureau open for a while. He finally shuts the bureau down out of nowhere like yeah he wasn't doing great but the bureau was fine he shuts it all down out of nowhere and the only thing he'll say is that three men came to him they were dressed in dark suits with dark hats with dark glasses they told him that he was right but they told him that he could not tell anybody and so that is our very first encounter with the men in black which happens I want to even say it was 52 um, Kenneth Arnold's famous sighting uh which is that happened in 1947 that's where we get the term flying saucer so pretty much as long as as there have been ufos there have been men in black so why do you think then um that if there's all all of these things happening kind of bring it back to point pleasant but there's all of these things right. happening around then why do you think kind of mothman stood out i i know john keel wrote his or called his book the mothman prophecy so that's why you know the movie then follows that but why do you think right if if he was researching all of these different things in his mind there had to have been something that made him kind of focus on mothman at least in the title to to draw that why do you think that would be so i think it's because out of all of the unknowns mothman is the least known Hmm. Right. The flying saucers, the and their inhabitants, the um, men in black, all of these things are things that even in 1967, 66, we knew things about. Um, But if you really go through and read the book, Mothman's not in it that much. (laughs) Like he's there. He maybe gets he 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 maybe gets I want to say out of a 300 page book, he maybe gets 30 pages of screen time. Oh. And then from there, it's all about the the other things happening as well. I think he he mentions the Mothman prophecies. He takes it and connects it very well to different, uh, basically different religious and mythological uh, frameworks throughout the world. So you have he actually calls the Mothman a Garuda, which is a sort of man bird thing of of Hindu lore that does act kind of as a portent of doom and that's where you get this idea that that mothman is potentially a portent of doom however without what happened to the bridge i don't necessarily think that 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 would be how we remember mothman even when there was a big there was actually a mothman sightings flap in chicago uh last year 
And so people, certain people have been kind of sitting around being like, uh, is something going to happen? What's going on? Uh, I'm kind of paranoid about this. And I really think at the end of the day, it all just comes down to timing because in the book, the Mothman prophecies, Mothman is not the one making the prophecies. He's not making the predictions. There are predictions and prophecies being made, but Mothman's pretty much just popping up every now and then to give you a spook and then, and then disappearing. Hmm. Now in the movie, there were some predictions that were made like, um, the Denver nine, the, they, I think the, and the mm-hmm. equator, the, you know, they mentioned the, the 300 will die. Um, so you're saying that Mothman wasn't necessarily really related with those? No, no, they, again, all of this is happening during the same time as the Mothman sighting. And honestly, potentially that, now that I think about it, that could be the reason as well, right? If, if this is all happening within a Mothman flap, Hmm. from November 66 to December 67 that might be why the focus is is put on that because even though Mothman himself is not or itself is not doing that much it is it is what seems to have heralded all of this essentially you have another individual named Mr. Apple and Apple is spelled A P O L unlike Indrid Cold, who is is primarily given the credit for making the prophecies that that lead to people's doom and gloom, it's actually Mr. Apple who makes a lot of these prophecies, and he does it via. <laughs> it's it's one of those situations where you have Apple, and he's talking to what is referred to as a contactee, somebody who has had contact with. Uh, an unknown force. I don't want to say extraterrestrial, but unknown force. And then those contactees relay their the message of Mr. Apple back to John Keel. And that, you know, that famous scene with Indrid Cold on the telephone, probably the scariest scene of everyone's childhood, where <laughs> you have this weird voice and, and it's telling John Klein exactly what he's doing. That, according to Keel... That sort of did happen, even down to him putting his watch in his shoe and then Mr. Apple saying, the watch is in your shoe. Huh. Um, yeah, and it, it's this individual who makes these predictions. Now, the thing about it, the the tragic thing about it, is that the Mothman Prophecies comes out in 1975, I want to say. So, unfortunately, there's no open-ended predictions here there's no you know in 2015 this is going to happen all of the predictions are in the past from the point of publishing so from there that's where you get a lot of skepticism and a lot of of just well of course he he made this prediction because that's what happened but the interesting thing about apple is that these predictions were both correct and incorrect at the same time so one of the best ones that he gives is regarding Martin Luther King Jr. Okay. Mr. Apple tells his contactee who then tells John Keel that Martin Luther King Jr. is going to be shot while standing on a balcony in Memphis, Tennessee. He tells him that it's going to happen on February 4th when in reality all of that is true but it happens on April 4th. Hmm. And it's it's the same sort of thing. He he all of the contactees are very worried about Pope Pope Paul the the sixth. They were saying Pope Paul is going to be assassinated by a man wearing black in an airport in a foreign land using a dagger and where you get like this earthquake. Right. They they made that prediction about the earthquake. Essentially. The Pope announced, or the the Vatican announced, I think it was July 20th of 1967, they announced that the Pope would be going to Turkey on the 26th. On the 22nd, there is an airplane, or sorry, on the 22nd, there is an earthquake, and a lot of people die in Turkey, but the assassination attempt doesn't happen until November 27th, 1970, three years later. And basically, Pope Paul is is in the Manila airport. It's the first time a pope ever visited the Philippines, and a man dressed in the black robes of a priest attacked him using a, a dagger. 
So you have these sort of similarities, but they're not completely accurate. And usually it's because of the time because, and I think, I think that they talk about it in the the movie, but I might be confusing it with a book. Essentially, it's as though these forces want John Keel to know that they know, but they don't want him to be able to do anything about it. Hmm. Right. When, when, he heard about this plan to kill MLK. He called MLK's entourage, wh- whatever it was, his his group of people, and tried to warn them. And they may or may not have taken it under advisement, but in any case, it doesn't matter because he wasn't killed until two months later. And and that is really what it comes down to. At the end of the Mothman prophecies, he is worried of a nationwide blackout. He says there's going to be, the the contactees have told me, of a nationwide blackout that's going to happen the moment that they flip the switch to turn on the Christmas tree at the White House, right? It's on December 15th, 1967. They're going to flip the switch. There's going to be a nationwide blackout. He stockpiled water and food and everything and got ready and told people, and I'm sure looked pretty crazy. And then he's watching this on TV with a buddy who is just sitting there freaked out of his mind. Keel is a pretty cool cat usually, but even he is, is pretty freaked out. They flip the switch. Keel braces for the blackout. Of course, there is no nationwide blackout, but then that's when the, uh, the news channel changes and says the, the bridge has collapsed Hmm. and such and such people are dead and such and such people are missing. So you have this idea that these people want Keel to know that they're in charge, that they're powerful, whether they're making these happen, things happen or they just have the power to see them. He never says. But just because they know doesn't mean he's going to know and doesn't mean he's going to be able to stop or help any of it, you know? Yeah, it, it sounds kind of like, um, kind of go, going back to the movie, as I recall, the, the parts where the specific predictions that they made were like the Denver nine, you know, 99 will die. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually paused the movie there cause I'm, I'm a nerd like that. Now I'll, I'll pause it to see the, <laughs> you know, the little TV that they are in the diner and, right. um, and it says like domain air flight nine out of Denver and mm-hmm. there's no domain air airline. No. So of course that's not real. Um, but it, you know, it sounds like they they took some of those things or some of those ideas similar with I think it was uh, in the newspaper you saw, saw um, Equator three hundred will die. You know, um, right? It it sounds like they're as far as the movie at least is concerned, they're taking events that that happen. I mean, obviously we ha- we have earthquakes, we have plane crashes. You know, we have these sort of tragedies and these sort of things, and kind of leading to as similar to what you said, where you know showing that this um, creature or entity or whatever you want to call it knows, knows mm-hmm. something, you know, know, it knows something and is kind of showing us that it knows it, but not letting us have enough information to be able to do anything about it. <laughs> right. Right. And that, yeah, I think that that's a, a, a big part of it. Um, he does state, and it's just in passing, but he states that the main reason that he believes Mr. Apple uh, is the fact that he made a very a series of very successful predictions regarding plane crashes. And he makes these predictions at the point when John Keel says, well, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you are crazy and you're not talking with an alien who's telling you the future. That's that's ridiculous. And then he says, well, really? Well, this plane's going to go down, this plane's going to go down, and this one's going to go down, and this mm. is when they're going to do it. And he says, fine, whatever. And then it happens. And then that's where... That's when the aliens really start, or sorry, not aliens, the whatevers, the, the <laughs> ultra terrestrials, uh, really start messing with him. Unfortunately, Keel does not tell us what planes, what flights, what, how many people, okay. and this and that. So I, I wonder, did Keel give any indication, or did you find anything in your research um, that might uh, have them maybe, maybe, did they know about it or were they causing it? I guess would be another thing because that would kind of be the first thing that comes to my mind is if you're going to tell me that yeah. this air, this plane is going to crash and this plane is going to crash and this plane is going to crash. Wait a minute. Are you doing this? <laughs> right. Are you actually predicting right. the future? Or are you causing these things to happen? <laughs> yeah, that's the question. And there's, there's really no straight answer on it. Um, 
you get the you get the sense he talks about what he calls it is the games that non people play n o n people play and he talks about these petty little games that the 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 controllers of the contactees make them play wherein one of the contactees will be told to and because keel is is communicating with everybody he can put this together individually they'd never know basically one of the contactees is told i think it's something like salt he's like take a pound of salt drive into the to the to the woods or something and leave it under this specific tree and so contact e will do that and then contact b contact e b will be told go to this specific tree and there will be salt there and that's how you can know that i am omniscient and all knowing is because <laughs> i i created the salt basically <laughs> and so it's it's bizarre man it is it is so weird because it is not what i would anticipate at all and and when I look at it under that lens, I say that these individuals do not have. I mean, you want to talk about how to crash a plane, you know, that can be made to happen. But when you're looking at earthquakes or or papal assassinations or assassination assassinations of MLK, things like that, I don't feel like they're powerful enough or or have that ability. To, to make that happen. I feel like they would be more likely to simply be observing it and reporting it. And if you, I guess if you follow some of the, the more typical UFO lore, the stuff that's not completely out there, you do have the idea of, of uh, the UFO inhabitants of being fourth dimensional creatures, whatever they are to the point where they can see through space and time. And so you have this idea that they could probably see these things happening, but not cause them. Now, at the same time, judging by that exact same rationale, you could say, well, it could be that the individual who who attempted to assassinate Pope Paul was a contactee, and he was he was told by Mr. A- Mr. Apple to assassinate Pope Paul and and the same thing with MLK and all of that. So it's that thing where you just have absolutely no answer. Hmm. I don't think, I will say that I don't think that whoever it is, whatever they're doing, I don't think that they have, even within this mythos, assuming that everything John Keel says is 100% true, nothing indicates that they have any sort of power over, you know, earthquakes and natural phenomena and, and even when it comes down to the bridge. You know, it's it's more about fortune telling than making it happen, especially with those those bigger things. As, as you're explaining that, the um, especially with the, the contactees kind of going, uh, you know, contact the A doing this and then mm-hmm. making it seem like the next person. <laughs> um, it was a surprise, yeah. right? Um, it almost reminded me of geocaching. I don't know if you remember that. I don't even know if it's still oh, around. Oh, yeah. Now, but, I, I went geocaching all the time, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean that it, it, that's what it sounds like to me. And uh, if if anybody's not familiar with that, essentially it's um, you have like a, a location, right? And there's going to be somebody put something there, and they say where the location is. And um, you'd be, at least in um, me growing up, there were you know websites I'd go to. It'd give a location, you know, usually coordinates or you know um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> latitude and longitude, and you you find where it's at. And that's kind of the fun of it is you go out there hiking wherever you know out in the wilderness and find this thing, and then you find the little treasure. I mean, it's all, it's different what it is, mm-hmm. right? It's never any, you're not actually you know, pirate gold or anything like that. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but you know, it's just the, the adventure of, of going out there and, and finding this. It, it sounds almost like if this happened in the sixties, like an, an early version of that. <laughs> <laughs> Extraterrestrial it, geocaching. It, yeah. It, it, it really yeah. does. <laughs> <laughs> so in the movie, there are some things that, um, they refer to as being associated with Mothman. Um, and I'll, I'll point two out because they're, they're kind of um, the two that kind of stood out to me. There was one where the lady, I uh, don't remember her name in the movie, but um, she claimed seeing red eyes outside of her window and, and, you know, this huge uh, six or seven foot tall creature. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there was another one where there was, I, I believe it was, um, it was uh, Gord- I think Gordon had this happen to him. Uh, Will Patton's or I keep saying Pattinson. Will Patton's character. <laughs> um, 
notice interference with the phone and it happened with mm-hmm. uh, John Klein as well. You know, you'd have these weird squeals and odd noises. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's kind of start with, I guess, Mothman's appearance. Was there, or is there something to that? The kind of the, the way the movie explains it being, you know, with red eyes and six or seven yeah. feet tall and then kind of the weird uh, interference and things like that. Were, were those things that happened with the Mothman sightings? Yes. Yeah. So I, I cannot recall one way or the other if I want to say that it probably did happen, but I can't recall one way or the other if there was that that story of the woman just seeing the red eyes at her window um, or out her window in the in reality in the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think even if it didn't, the point that it serves is primarily Mothman has two super defining features. Um Obviously, he's weird all in all, but his <laughs> his eyes are the number one thing, right? They're these red eyes, and they are hypnotizing. And you kind of see this in the very beginning when John Klein's wife dies in the car accident. Mm. You see her just go blank and to look into these eyes and then have everything else happen. Um And that is his most defining characteristic to the point where we don't necessarily even have a good description of Mothman's face because everyone who saw him saw the eyes and said the eyes drew their focus. They could not focus on anything else. One of the witnesses, Connie Carpenter, who was actually Mary Heyer's niece, said that it was a miracle she didn't run her car off the road when she had her experience because those eyes you just could not stop looking at them, Hmm. which Keel then takes that and makes that association with, um, basically the hypnosis that, that UFOs and, and Mothman seem to put people under and how eyes or how lights can be used to induce miniature Caesar seizures and stuff like that. And that's what he thinks of as a scientific rational explanation. But those eyes are the primary thing. The second thing are his wings. Because everything else, I mean, I have seen a guy who was seven foot tall once. It was sure. insane, <laughs> but it was not paranormal. Right. So <laughs> that that in and of itself isn't isn't too big of a deal. And his typical size is six to seven feet. Um his wings though are are dark bat like wings that unfurl unfurl from his back to stand at about a, a wingspan of ten feet. So very large. And then what happens essentially he never flaps these wings. Hmm. Not once. He simply unfurls the wings and then with them being unfurled, he is able to rise into the air and glide around. Which is just bizarre. Just so like doesn't no make other any no sense. other way of doing that that's been visible. No, like I don't want to say jetpack, but I mean you know, like no, no no other that you is, know form but of that is being a, able to uh, levitate like that or just that is essentially what it sounds like. Is that he has a jetpack on? Like I'm not saying that's <laughs> what it is at all, but yeah, it, it shows no physical actual creation of thrust. Nothing that would would possibly get him off the ground. He just unfurls his wings, and there he goes. Um, Strange. And that is something as well that we kind of mentioned in our first episode. That was not a widely reported aspect of him. But when John Keel checked everything out, everybody said the same thing. Nobody saw him with his wings flapping, but at, at the very first, in the first few days before the story got way, way, way big... Nobody talked about how his wings didn't flap. And it's one of those tiny little details that to me just makes it seem all the more like if if over a hundred people, because that's what it ends up being, if over a hundred people are going to lie, why did the first 16 of them, 12 to 16 of them, all have this one random little fact? Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's just bizarre. But so that's that's him. He's also covered in grayish it's kind of fur. All it really says is gray. Um, and, and he has legs like a man. So that's the other big thing is people say, well, Mothman was just the Sandhill crane. And to that, I say that's 
if you, if you look at what the witnesses actually said, that's completely impossible because the sandhill crane has the legs of a bird and Mothman has the legs of a man. I don't want to go way into a completely a side tangent here, but it sounds almost like he's Batman. <laughs> I mean, like you've got the you've got the he's got the big cape, right? And he never really mm-hmm. flaps it. He uses his you know um, oh, I don't remember the um, grapple to you know repel yeah. up, up and things like that, right? Um, so his You're cape isn't how he gets around, but he's got this huge the wings, right? The same sort of wings, and I don't know. It, it, that's just the first thing that came to mind when you mentioned that he's. The wings are almost pointless. Like, what's the point of wings if you're not going to flap them and actually use them to fly? Well, then it's a cape almost. (laughs) It's true. And the name Mothman, so the first two or three days, people are just saying this big bird. This big bird was seen in Point Pleasant. This big bird looked like a man and had glowing red eyes. And then basically, I think it was a fella in Chicago. I can't remember exactly. But some reporter saw the story and said, oh, I'm going to name it Mothman. And that was actually based off of a Batman villain, was Mothman. So, yeah, it, the Batman parallels run deep in this. <laughs> so Mothman is from Batman. Nice. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so what about kind of the weird, the interference and things like that the that they had yeah. in the movie? Was that something that, that occurred as well? That is absolutely something that happened. Um, the phone system plays a really big part in the book. Uh, which is a weird thing to say, but it's true. Basically, you have almost every single individual who had a UFO sighting or a Mothman sighting, they would, within the following days and weeks and, and months, they would answer their phones just to have the phone squeal, or they would have the phone make uh, basically Morse code beeps at them, Um you had like the stereotypical answering it and there's nobody there or there's someone there, but it's, it sounds like heavy breathing, but no one's actually there sort of thing or no one's talking. You then also have the idea that when Mothman and the UFOs are around in that moment, these things will happen. There was actually an individual who may or may not have been the actual first sighting of Mothman. He reported his sighting after the, the, uh, the customary, the one that everyone thinks of, which is four kids in a car driving around and seeing him. This was an individual about 90, I want to say 90 to 100 miles away, who claimed to have seen the Mothman 90 minutes before these kids did. And essentially he he knew that he he knew something was happening because he was sitting inside watching his television and then the reception bugged out and his TV started just acting crazy and getting getting fuzz and coming back and and distorting and he went outside and he saw these black or sorry he saw these big red eyes staring at him out of the trees his dog ran in to to attack this thing and then the dog never came back and then the eyes disappeared and once the eyes disappeared the tv went back to normal so this idea of like everything electronic going haywire completely lines up not only with these sightings but with pretty much the majority of modern ufo sightings as well um you have as well with when it comes to the phone you have a lot of weird situations where john keel is is talking to people and saying people are saying like oh john it was so good to talk to you two days ago and he was like i never what do you mean we didn't talk two days ago and he says no you called me on the phone and we talked about this and this and Keel says that people seem to be imitating his voice and he's getting calls from fellow ufologists who he can identify as not actually being them. But it sounds like them and they're talking about things they would be talking about, but little things are just wrong. So, yeah, the phones are a, are a big part of the phenomena. Is now in the book though were they were they actually associated with Mothman or were they associated with some of the other aspects they're associated with both okay. they're associated with Mothman for sure if you have a Mothman sighting you're going to have the beeps and the squeals at least and maybe also um picking up the phone hearing other people 
discussing you. That would happen sometimes. Um, but as much as that happened with Mothman, it also did happen with the, the UFOs as well. Hmm. Okay. Well, okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to kind of break the fourth wall here for a moment because Mm -hmm. I just noticed it is hailing outside. (laughs) Oh no! Um, so, okay. if you're listening to this and you hear something in the background, I'm going to keep going. But um, that's hail right now. We're in the middle of a big storm, <laughs> oh, so man. you know Halloween, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but let's move on to kind of like the the big finale in the movie, and that's the mm-hmm. the steel bridge um, on the or the silver bridge made out of steel, but yes. um, silver bridge on the Ohio <laughs> yes. River that dies and or not people die on it right and well it, it, the bridge itself the bridge itself dies, is, I is a great tragedy i think it, that's what they yes. uh, Wathman called it right a great tragedy on the river ohio um, yeah so obviously if the movie is set in 2002 uh and obviously it, the timeline shifted so it didn't happen in 2002 would be my guess um but did right. it even happen at all would be my question yeah good question and yes it did it it happened on that final day of of the Mothman flap, which was December fifteenth, nineteen sixty seven, so it 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 absolutely happens. Um, you get this idea that certain individuals, right before the the bridge collapsed, looked over to see red lights. It doesn't say whether they were the red eyes of Mothman or red UFOs or whatever, kind of circling around the bridge. And even from there, we aren't able to say, you know, did these things directly cause uh, the bridge to collapse or what? But the Silver Bridge definitely went down. And unfortunately, quite a few people, I think it's around 36 people, I want to say, lost their lives in the the tragedy. Do you know what the official cause was that, I mean, did authorities actually say that it was Mothman or some sort of uh, creature that caused this to happen? I, what was the official uh, I wish authorities would say it was Mothman. No. Um, <laughs> and to be straight, I don't necessarily think Mothman or the UFOs caused it. The official report was that this this bridge was built for when the population had a lot less people traveling in it. So the thing is, right, Point Pleasant is not a very large area, but that is the Silver Bridge is the only bridge for, I think, like 25, 50 miles. So it had an an extremely high amount of traffic uh, beyond what the engineers had, had originally planned. And really what it came down to is the bridge was old, the bridge was not well maintained and the bridge collapsed and that's why again when we look at like are these things causing it or are they just predicting it that's a big big strike in the prediction column because at the end of the day they they were and they actually what they did is they this is this is crazy to me that they could do this but they essentially grabbed all the pieces of the bridge they could and they reassembled it elsewhere and that's how they came to that conclusion so I I trust that pretty well there were no like cut lines or or broken you know intentionally sabotaged beams or anything like that it was just a tragic event of basically neglect yeah i i could see that i mean i've i've not been near anybody who does that for uh, bridges and such but i actually i used to work um was contracted to the air force and i worked in a, a materials lab where we did very similar sort of things for aircraft engines and um or really aircraft overall engines were kind of our specialty but um and so if there was something that failed um usually you know whether it be corrosion or you know creep or like the part just failing you know Mm -hmm. figuring out what that is would be something that I guess my point being there's labs out there that can do that kind of thing to figure out exactly what causes something to fail um, yeah, and it's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, there's incredibly smart people to be able to figure that kind of stuff out. But yeah, I would I would trust <laughs> what, what yeah. their assessment is. Yeah, like a part of me. I mean, I don't want to say a part of me wants it to be Mothman because that would say a part of me wants it to have happened. Obviously, I don't want it to have happened. But uh, you know, I I would have loved for it to come back and been one of those situations. Like 
I'm sh- I think as the movie makes it out, that bridge is perfectly fine. It it never had yeah. an issue all its life. You know, wh- where's this coming from? Un- yeah, that just wasn't the case, unfortunately. Well, it only takes one issue to <laughs> can be perfectly yeah, fine, seriously. and then only only once, right? Yeah. So overall, I'm going to ask you kind of the big question. We've we've talked about it, um, but <laughs> do you believe Mothman to be real? And overall, kind of how would you say, um, even though the the details and stuff that we've talked about, the, sounds like the movie changed quite a bit. Do mm-hmm. you think that the the spirit of Mothman came through pretty well for the Mothman prophecies, the movie, not the book. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Right. Um, I would say personally, I'm going to put myself in the, the yes column. I believe John Keel in his book, I think it's like, Oh, what one is it? It's not the Mothman prophecies. It actually came out a few years before he he cataloged 26 individual sightings that he found to be credible of Mothman. It was called like strange beasts and wonderful wonder, something like that. I've completely butchered it. That's not it at all. Anyway, in a, he catalogs 26 individual sightings. And when you take all of these sightings together, it adds up to over a hundred reliable witnesses who, who saw something. My co-host Jason is the skeptic of us and that's fine. And that's why we love him. And that's why he's on the show. I'm on the show. It works. Jason has gone through and found a good amount of hoaxing that happened. He found stories Mm. of people who tied like lanterns to balloons, people who there was one individual, according to him, who had a, a biplane essentially and would be flying it and then would cut the engine and glide over people. Oh. Right. And almost basically almost crash his plane just to get a rise out of these people. So I think that the human ability to hoax and to to get a laugh at someone else's expense is extremely high. And I think that that plays a big part in all of this. But I think that when you go back there, there's so much more evidence we didn't even touch on here. But when you go back, when you examine all of it, I think to say that everybody was hallucinating to say that it was the sandhill crane which john keel took pictures of that bird and showed it to everyone and everyone said no that's not what i saw uh to say it was an owl or anything else like that any standard explanation i think just isn't going to cut it um i don't know exactly what i think about mothman i think that it's definitely not something that can be easily explained or or currently understood um but i do think that it happened as far as the movie, I think that the movie was created by a man. I don't know if you do you listen to Astonishing Legends at all. I, I've heard a few episodes. I don't listen regularly. There's just way too many shows out there. <laughs> I know it's insane. Um, <laughs> Astonishing Legends. There are pod fathers. They're listening to their show is what made me inspired to do ours, and they have an amazing first off an amazing series on Mothman. But they actually through some weird confluence of events and stuff they know the the screenwriter of the mothman prophecies oh. um and so they've had him on i want to say twice now his name's rich haddam he is a believer in the paranormal he is not just some individual who sat down and said oh i'm getting paid to, to turn this book into a movie he truly wants to get to the bottom of this and wants to tell this fantastic story. And I want to say that Rich did the best he could. And it is a good, entertaining, fun, kind of spooky movie in and of Mm -hmm. itself. At the end of the day, it's, it's not going to be exactly like the, the book because you simply couldn't be. Um, but I think that he kept the spirit of, of Mothman and the spirit of John Keel alive, even if he had to change a lot of the the details to get there. Sure. Well, I mean, even in what we've covered, there's so much more. <laughs> than yeah. Just yeah. The, you know the the Mothman aspect and things like that. And something I touch on the hoaxes real quick because I know that is something that not just with Mothman but in any of these sort of um, happenings, hoaxes happen. A lot, right? And, you know, a lot of people try to do that kind of thing. But the thing that always sticks in in my mind is in in order to get 
uh, hoaxes on the level of, you know, consistency in the reports, right? You'd have mm-hmm. to have, at least I would assume, you'd have to have some sort of um, some sort of report that happens first to lead that off, right? So what is yep. what does this look like? What is this what is this creature or being or whatever it is? What does this initially look like? Um, okay, it has red eyes. It has wings that don't flap. It has you know all these different things, and then that's kind of what the hoax is based off of, right? Kind of going off of that. Mm-hmm. Um, Otherwise, it would seem like you just have a bunch of random things that don't have any connection whatsoever. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's just that's just kind of my thought on the the hoax side of it because I get that, and yeah, there's definitely could be, and I'm not, I'm sure there are, you know, a lot of hoaxes right, and right. things like that out there um, that kind of filter into a lot of it. But I don't know. It sounds sounds like definitely like some, something interesting happened. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm uh, I'm the same way. I say, I I with, with these sorts of things where you have a lot of people seeing it, whether it's Mothman, whether it's the Jersey Devil, these sorts of things, you have to have at least some kernel of truth. Some things you don't have to have a kernel of truth. Some t- things can be completely made up lies. Sure. Um, I don't like to assume that. I always take everyone at their word until proven otherwise, and maybe that's my problem. But, you know, if you have one or two people saying something, if you have a husband and a wife or a family or or I'd say even up to 10 people, you could just have people straight up saying, ah, let's tell a story, let's get some notoriety. For it to be disparate people, different things, different events, different times there's got to be some kernel of truth and that's that's what it comes down to for me as well so i agree completely and i i think if uh anything listeners of um this show will know that with with a lot of movies right i mean they claim to be based on a true story and there but there's there's that kernel of truth in there and a lot of times the movie changes things completely but still we're trying to find that kernel of truth, and it sounds like we're yeah. kind of in a similar path, different different topics perhaps, but similar path, trying to find that kernel of truth, whatever it may be. I like that. I think so. I, I like the idea of us as kindred spirits. That's good. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah, the, the, movie, the movie has that kernel. Unfortunately, because it had to be a narrative, otherwise people wouldn't see it. Sure. I mean, John Keel didn't have a wife. He died a bachelor. Uh, his non-existent wife never got in a car crash. This never spurred him off to get to the bottom of it. You know, all of this and that. He wasn't even in Point Pleasant when the bridge collapsed. But at the end of the day, if it's a movie about Mothman and not a movie about John Keel, I think that they were pretty pretty close to the source there. Very good. Well, I really appreciate your time, Sam. And uh, before we wrap up, I know you've got plenty more on not only um, Mothman, but also plenty more topics. Can you let everybody know where they can find your podcast? Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, open up your favorite podcast app. We're there. Just search not alone. Um, iTunes, Stitcher. Apparently we're having a problem on Stitcher, but I'm getting that, trying to get that fixed right now. Regardless, iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, um, the, the other non podcatcher place to find us would be our website which is notalonepodcast.com. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Twitter. You could just search Not Alone Podcast on any of those and you'll find us. Uh, if you have any any suggestions for us, if you want to talk to us at all, you can email us at notalonepodcast at gmail.com, especially if you want to correct me. That is my favorite thing in the world. I, a lot of people, even like in regards to this interview, if I said something wrong, please let me know because I want to know. I don't want to be given false information, but... Yeah, we're we're everywhere. If Jason were here, he would say just Google us. Which, by the <laughs> way, <laughs> that is that's what he loves to say every episode. Jason wishes he could make it. We just trying to wrangle three people is like wrangling catch, and he just had to work. So he's here in spirit. Well, I I appreciate your time coming on, Sam, and, and uh, talking Mothman prophecies with me. Yeah, my pleasure. If you ever need any other spooky movies or or weird anything like that, you just let me know. I'm your guy. All right, sounds good. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan LeFebvre. 
along with, of course, some help from my good friend Sam over at the Not Alone podcast who stopped by to keep me company this Halloween. If you want to learn more about Mothman, I'd recommend checking out Sam and his co-host Jason's podcast. Unfortunately, Jason couldn't join us today, but Sam mentioned it there at the end of our chat, and I'll reiterate here because it's worth your time to check it out. You can find their show at notalonepodcast.com or by searching for Not Alone wherever podcasts are found. And as always, I'll add a link to Sam and Jason's show at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. As a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, the Silver Bridge really did collapse, killing many people. Number two, John Klein was real, but he actually worked for the New York Times and not the Washington Post. Number three, Mothman sightings weren't the only weird thing reported in Point Pleasant. Did you find out which one is a lie? The lie is... Number two. John Klein was a fictional character based on the book's author, John Keel. But as we learned, John Keel wasn't a newspaper reporter who happened upon these events. Instead, he was searching for answers to some of the strange reports after the fact. And now, it's your turn. Since this is the Halloween season, I think it's the perfect time to ask you a question. Do you believe in the paranormal or the unexplained? What do you think were behind these strange reports? Were they just hoaxes? Or was there something to kick them off? Was there something more? Hop on to the Based on a True Story Facebook group and let's chat about it. Or if you'd prefer, you can find me directly on Twitter where I'm at Dan Lefeb, D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B. The show was on Instagram, where I like to post some photos of the real faces and places behind what we've learned here on the show, not only for this episode, but for all of our episodes. That's at Based on a True Story Podcast on Instagram. And if social media isn't your thing, remember you can always say hi by emailing me. I'm dan at Based on a True Story Podcast.com. Thanks so much for listening, and from my family to yours, have a very safe and fun Halloween. Halloween.